In this week's In-Ear Insights, we're talking about prompt engineering, which is the art and science of writing prompts to talk to large language model AI systems, and how prompt engineering is really actually software development. Uh, this past weekend, I was doing a bit of uh, ruminating on it and realizing that with things like Microsoft Copilot, and Google Palm, and GPT-4, and all the, the galaxy of uh, acronyms out there, when we roll out the ability for a an office worker to talk to PowerPoint or Excel with a prompt and access to GPT-4, the large language model, and have it do something like create a PowerPoint presentation from this Excel spreadsheet. We are really talking about how a human being talks to a computer, right? how a human being gives instructions to a computer, which is software development. So the art of prompt engineering is how we write those programs to talk to computers. And now that this is coming to Microsoft Office and, and Google Docs and stuff, everyone, every employee who works in Office productivity software is going to become a software developer, right? Because when they write prompts, they're writing software. So Katie, I want to ask you about the software development lifecycle and how when you think about prompt engineering, how it's going to evolve. So as a refresher for folks who don't remember, the software development cycle looks like this. So Katie, do you want to step through this real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So the software development life cycle is exactly that. It's a life cycle. Um, and it's meant to be repeated over and over and over again. So you start with your purpose. What's the question we're trying to answer? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Then you do your requirements gathering. What do I need? And you can use the five P's for this. So what is the purpose, people, process, platform, performance, um, to understand, you know, what are all the bits and pieces that I need to answer the question to solve the problem? Then you go into design. And so design is an interesting one because it doesn't always mean you know, putting together, you know, images and pictures. Design in this instance could be, you know, based on your purpose and your requirements. It could be just a simple user interface. It could be something, um, <clears throat> it could, you know, it doesn't have to include like really intricate graphics. And so this is something that, you know, the requirements will dictate. Then you develop, then you actually do the thing. And so based on all this other information, you actually create the thing and then you test it. So you need to make sure that you have someone who isn't you QAing this thing. And then once you figure out what's going on, what's working, what's not, then you, you know, refine it, you improve it. And then you deploy it to the public and then you maintain it and then you start all over again because once it's out there and people are using the thing, they're going to have feedback. So you got to start over again with what's the problem we're trying to solve. And you just keep going around and around and around um, until, you know, there's no more feedback until you can't be, improve it. And then you move on to a different version of the thing. Okay. So now with that, how, how do you see it applying to prompt engineering? Well, I think you start at the top with the purpose. So what is the problem that you're trying to solve with prompt engineering? And so my understanding of prompt engineering is that it is the set of instructions that you are giving to uh, something like a chat GPT or to the machine so that you can get something back. And so the problem that you're trying to solve with prompt engineering is I have a question that I need answered, or I have, you know, a piece of content that I need a first draft for, or I have a set of notes that I need a summary for. Okay. So then how do we apply requirements gathering to that? So the, with the requirements gathering, if you think about the five P's, so, you know, you already covered the purpose. You already know what question you're trying to answer. So then who are the people? So are, is it just solely you uh, who needs to get their outcome of this thing? Is there, you know, are, is Chris asking me to do this because he needs this thing? So what are his needs? What are the questions that he's trying to answer? And so on and so forth. And then what is the process? How am I going to go ahead and write this? Do I already know how to write this? Do I have to do some research? Do I have to ask others who have done prompt engineering before? Uh, are there best practices? Can I borrow uh, the platform? It could be ChatGPT. There's a lot of other AI 
tools out there now and then performance how do i know that i got the thing that i wanted and so those that's how you gather requirements for something like prompt engineering that feels very simple but you want to make sure that you're not wasting your time right and the reason this is so important is that as companies start to use large language models and prompt engineering within them when everyone from the the janitor to the ceo will be using these in some capacity uh, you're going to want to have a, a system for storing and, and deploying prompts at scale. So it's not just, you know, you sitting at your desk writing a blog post. This has the potential to be how you build certain types of enterprise software, at the very least enterprise software processes. So let's walk through this. Let's let's talk about how we can apply this to actual uh, a real life situation. So let's start with... Um, Let's start with writing a blog post because um, a lot of folks have been asking, how do I write better prompts uh, for, for all these large language models? And the answer is the software development lifecycle. So our purpose is we're going to write a blog post for what, SEO purposes? Sure. What does SEO look like in 2023? I like that. Okay. So uh, we our requirements, uh, what are our requirements for, for this post? So the requirements, I would say, um, you know, if I were doing this cold, I would say the requirements are the problem I'm trying to solve is I need a first draft. The purpose is uh, I, as a marketer, need a first draft of a blog post about, 20, about SEO in 2023 so that I can expedite the process of writing the blog post because I needed it yesterday and I'm procrastinating. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things that prompt engineering uh, needs because of the way these models work is there's, there are three parts. There's, uh, there's role, user, and assistant. Um, and each of these people, right, the, the, of the five piece, uh, has a distinct role to play. When we write prompts, we have to implicitly declare those things. So the, the, the first part, which is the role part, is where we tell the system what it who it is or what it what kind of person it is so i'm going to start off with you will act as a blogger you have expertise in blogging content creation long-form content content marketing content for seo the reason we do this like this is because we are giving it guardrails we're saying this is what the knowledge what words and associations we want to draw from um now the next part is we want to also declare some knowledge about it so you have specialization in search engine optimization, engine marketing, SEO, SEM, and optimizing content for. Okay, so that tells it even more guardrails. Like these, these, this is the, the topic where you have expertise. So I do <clears throat> want to point out, Chris, so as we were walking through the software development lifecycle, there was that sticky design phase. And so typically we think of that as graphic design. Um, in this case, what you're doing is designing the prompt. And so design, again, it's sort of one of those, it's dependent on what it is that you're doing. Design is gonna mean different things. And so you're actually designing the prompt to then bring into development. And so you have to do those two things in parallel. You could make an argument that in this instance, design and development are the same thing. And I, I think you'd be right. That was actually what I was going to ask is, is this feels like I'm doing a bit of both at the same time. Mm -hmm. You are. Um, and so it, you know, it depends on the kind of development that you're doing. Like, is there a front end? No. So then design is not going to mean that you're going to bring in, you know, UX designers and IA and, you know, your typical creative directors. You don't need that for this. Design in this instance is literally designing the prompt, but also at the same time, you're starting to get into that development phase because you're getting into those specifics. And so the design is sort of that template that you'll reuse over and over again. And then the development are the specific pieces of the prompt that are going to change each time you're talking to the machine. Okay. So... Do you feel like we're ready to, to move on to the next section, which is test? So I, I do. I mean, so, and this is the thing with software development is at some point, 
you have to say it's good enough to, to start testing. Um, one of the downfalls of software development is that we get ourselves into this mindset that it has to be perfect and have zero issues the first time out. And that's just not true. And that's why a, that's why a process like Agile is so great because it kind of, it time boxes you into here's everything we can get done within two weeks and then we'll test it and then we'll continue to iterate it versus more waterfall development, which can feel like it just go on forever and never even get to the testing phase. So, so I would the, say, go ahead. So for the individual user mm -hmm. uh, who just wants to improve their prompts, which is the better methodology for them? Is it more of an agile methodology or more of a waterfall methodology for, this, for a single person who's just trying to make better prompts for, for their blog posts? I would argue that agile is still a better process um, because again, it's the, there is no such thing as perfect development. You know, you have to start testing, S defining your requirements and designing the prompts is going to save you a lot of, you know, computing time, probably resource time and cost to the system itself. But at some point you have to say, okay, I've been writing this for three straight days and I still haven't tested it. I should probably just get something in there and see what happens. And so time boxing it and saying, I'm going to do three iterations of this or four iterations of this um, is going to help you start to refine it faster. Whereas with waterfall, it, if, you've, if you've never seen a waterfall process, it literally looks like a set of stairs where you have to complete one thing before you move on to the next. And so with waterfall, one of the challenges with software development is you have to fully complete the software development before you test. And it doesn't allow for ease of going back to previous stages like refining your requirements like refining your design if you find way down the line in the testing phase that you didn't get something right whereas agile lets you iterate faster almost like this uh little circles gotcha okay so it, while gpt4 uh cranks away here we're at the testing phase mm -hmm. of this where we've, we've just uh started having it do its thing and it is, it, it is spitting out, you know, some, I think, okay stuff. We, it has said, you know, the, the world of SEO is evolving. Um, core Web Vitals user experience is king. I would, I would say that's probably not um, the future of SEO. That's the present day of SEO. Um, AI to machine learning, voice search and natural language processing, zero-click searches, which, again, that's like from 2018. So you can tell that it's drawing on uh, its heritage of, of information that's already known. Semantic SEO and topic clusters, again, that's that's relatively old news um but it is it is still relevant um and, and so i think the the purpose here um of satisfying uh writing a first draft of a blog post you know, yeah you network error uh is is pretty okay it's 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 done a a pretty decent job but i feel like it's missing some stuff so this is where in your requirements you define the uh user acceptance testing criteria. So if your performance measure, if your success measure is just it wrote a blog post, well, then you're never going to know is the blog post good enough? Does it have the following five facts? Are the facts from 2018? Or are the facts from 2023? And so that's where spending more time up front and this I'll, I've never met a developer who enjoys doing requirements is like, you know what, let's spend more time doing requirements because it's going to save me some time on the back end. I've never, ever in my life, like find me that person and I will give them a dollar. Um, but you have to spend that time up front defining mm -hmm. these things because otherwise this is where you start to waste time is, you know, I might look at this and know, I won't know a lot about SEO just in this example and be like, yeah, well, it wrote a post. Okay, I'm done. And you're saying this as a subject matter expert, you're saying half of this information is out of date. And so how do we know that it has satisfied the requirements without defining those things? Mm -hmm. So if I'm, again, if I'm a person, you know, sitting at my desk writing a prompt, this is the prompt that we came up with. And as we saw, it came up with okay stuff, right? It certainly was lucid and coherent. It made sense. It wasn't anything new because by definition, it can't necessarily write anything new um, drawing on its knowledge base. 
but there's some stuff that I feel like we probably should have had. So is this now the improved cycle? This is. And so this is where you start refining. So you have your baseline of what you started with. And then based on the output that it gave you, what in the output didn't work. So that's where you start to refine. And so typically you would have some sort of a tracker system or a spreadsheet or even just a document that says, you know, these are the things that worked. Don't touch those things. These are the things that didn't work. Let's refine those. And then you generate the content again and see, did I fix the things that weren't working or did I make them worse? And so it's, you know, very simplistic bug tracking of, you know, did I close the bug? Is it, you know, critical? Can I move forward with these things? Or do I have to start over again because it's blocking my ability to get this out to a, you know, public, you know, production site? Right. Um... And with testing, with QA testing, again, you know, the thing about Agile is it kind of time boxes it. So you could be testing forever. You could be refining forever. Or you could say, because you did your requirements, this is the acceptance criteria. This is when I know it's good enough to get out there. It has to have the following five things. When it has these five things, we can go out there and then we can move it into maintenance mode. I feel like for, with SEO, if we're writing a post for SEO, we typically want to have some kind of focus, some kind of topic of focus. So I've added that in because, mm -hmm. you know, it's important. Um, I think the integration of large language models within search engines is important. And obviously it won't know that. So I, I think we need to provide that fact. Mm -hmm. I told it to give it some length, a specific length, and it was told it to, uh, to write in a specific type of tone. So let's see if it comes up with anything better within our, our improved cycle. And I'm uh, for convenience sake, I'm switching to GPT 3.5 instead of GPT 4 for speed because GPT 4 is substantially slower. Um, in reality, that would probably be part of the requirements as well as so deciding which, which of the engines of the models you're going to use. Well, yeah, that's the uh, platform part of the piece. So as okay, we're so just watching this spin through, so this is part, this is all part of the testing phase. And so we found that version one was okay, but didn't fully work. So now we're in the test and improve. And the thing that actually, as I'm looking at this graphic, if you're uh, listening to this, we have the software development lifecycle up on our screen. If you want to switch over to YouTube and see this, I would actually almost Make put like, yeah, a, and a loop around test and improve because that's where you tend to spend the most time. But again, sort of, you have that acceptance criteria defined from your requirements gathering in order to know when you're done and you can move on from that test and improve to deploy. Yep. Okay. So we've got our post. This is better. Um, it, it matches more the tone. We've got future of SEO. We've got our key phrase uh, repeated mm -hmm. four, five times. So it's actually did a great job there. Um, mm -hmm. We check the box on uh, large language model integration. So this post is in much better shape now than it was even just a couple of minutes ago. So the question now becomes, how do we take this prompt? What does deploy mean? So I would say that this then, in this specific context, deploy means that this then becomes the template and other people in your organization can start to reuse it. The set of instructions that you would need to give with this is basically calling out the words and phrases that need to be replaced to switch the context. And so, you know, if you're always forever writing a blog, you could start as the, you will act as a blogger, you have expertise in blogging, content creation, so on and so forth, and then start to call out, um, you know, you have a specialization in search engine optimization. Well. My post is about PPC ads. And so that's the phrase that you start to switch out. So you have a specialization in, you know, paid media or PPC ads or whatever the topic is. And so then you keep, write the first draft of this blog answering the following questions. Keep that part. You know, what does the future of SEO look like in 2023? What does PPC, what do PPC ads look like in 2023? Or whatever the topic is. And so you start to 
create that template that in this instance, because you're not, you don't have a product to deploy, but you have this template that everyone can start to use and it starts to become the standard. And so that is good enough to give people a starting place. I would agree with that and add to it that what you said is exactly right. This is the template. And if we were to take this apart, mm -hmm. um, I would maybe turn this into like a variable field. So we'll just put a placeholders here for now. Right. And so you can put those variables in there. I would also provide people with the version that you started with just so they can see. But so you have both versions, you have the templated version, and then you have the example versions Then go, Oh, that's what you mean by a key phrase. Okay, that's what you mean by details. Exactly. And now here's where the system becomes really powerful. This, which we've just worked on, can now go into actual software. So I could now integrate, take that prompt that we were just uh, were working on and put in the different variables and provide it with, say, my entire SEO keyword list, right? Um, and, and the associated questions that go with each of them. And now, instead of having a prompt that I paste into ChatGPT manually, now I have a system that I could generate 900 blog posts uh, that we know are going to be good in quality because we've proven the prompt, mm -hmm. feed it in and have it do its thing. And then, you know, guess what? There's my content marketing for the year done because we took the time to do this prompt. So I want to open people's eyes to the, the reality that when you're doing prompt engineering, you're doing software development. And if you want it to be scalable mm -hmm. and, and be part of, what's going to make your company some money, you got to use the software development lifecycle. Um, and I agree with that. And then when you get past the deploy phase, so, you know, in this example, you said you put it into your software and you create, generate 900 blog posts for the year. Well, the platforms themselves are rapidly changing. And that's where you get into this last phase of maintain. And so, Maintenance includes things like user feedback. Hey, I tried this prompt and I'm finding that it's throwing an error at this, at this stage because the system has changed or the way in which it's writing has changed or whatever the thing is. And so that's where you start to continually refine it. So I've never known a piece of software to ever just be static. It's never just been deployed and then sat there. Anyone who does that doesn't have good software. And so this software is constantly being maintained and updated and bug fixes because with software, there's so many variables that are out of your control. Um, the way in which the language that you code in is going to have updates, new libraries, there's going to be new methodologies. The platforms that you develop in are going to be constantly evolving. And if you're using third party software like a chat GPT that you didn't develop yourself, then you need to make sure that your prompts are reflective of the changes in those systems. And so if you don't actively seek out user feedback, then you should make some sort of reminder of like at least once a month, maybe once a quarter, depending on how often you're using it, to check in to make sure that the piece of software, in this case, the prompt that you deployed, is still working as expected, is still getting the same result that user acceptance testing that you got from the original set of requirements. And if not, you need to start, you know, that's where the process starts all over again. What is the purpose? What is the problem we're trying to solve? And then you don't have to write requirements from scratch, but just sort of note what's changed. And so then you can go through the other stages more quickly. Exactly. And even if you don't do the software development part, you know, uh, scaling this thing, you still want to have, a system, some kind of governance around how you manage your library of these things, including you may not want to give them away, right? Because you're still developing software. Companies generally don't give their source code away for free. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to keep in mind too about the, about the governance around the software you, you develop. Well, and then there's also, you know, how you check software in and out, the version history, version control, all the good stuff. And so that gets sort of deeper into the weeds of how software development actually operates, but it's good enough for companies that are just sort of 
at the starting line of using prompt engineering and systems like ChatGPT to have maybe a collaborative Google Doc to say, you know, on this date, on, you know, March 20th, 2023, this was the prompt that we all decided we were going to use because we went through all of those stages. And then we find out that, you know, ChatGPT has a major update on, you know, April 15th. And so then you start to document on April 16th, this is the prompt we're starting to use now. And so you can see that version history um, as you go through it. And you can see how it's evolved um, so that when you go back and say, hey, we want to do this thing, you already have all that documentation so you know what's working, what's not working. So one of the things that I know you've asked me that I haven't gotten around to yet <laughs> is putting together a library of props for trust insights, right? Yes. What would that, so is that what that looks like to you? Is it is just a bunch of Google Docs? How would, how would you tell me, hey, um, you know, with as little overhead as possible because nobody loves excess overhead, right. how, would, how should I think about making this library of props so that all of us within Trust Insights can use them? So I think it can be as simple as a Google Doc or a set of Google Docs to have something, you know, like a use case, like what is this prompt used for, the date that it was last revised, the prompt with the variables, and then the example. And then, you know, once a quarter, we go through the ones that we use most often and say, here's what we've learned from this prompt, or anytime the prompt has to change, because something external has changed, we just note it in that doc and say last revised on, you know, June 2nd, or last, re or, you know, and if we look at the prompts and say, huh, we never got around to using this particular prompt, then, you know, that tells us maybe that was the wrong use case. But I think it can be a simple Google Doc to say, if you're looking for, you know, a really strong prompt for writing a blog post that's 500 words, here's the prompt to start with. Or if you're looking to uh, summarize a set of call notes, here's the prompt to use for that. Would you, would you state it as a user story or would you make it a prompt story? What's, what, what's a prompt story? I know I just made that up. Oh, okay. <laughs> then I don't know. I would state it as a user story because you as the person are trying to accomplish a task by using these prompts with this software. So it still starts with, you know, as a time crunched marketer, I want to use a blog generating prompt so that I can have a first draft of a good blog post. Or as a CEO, I want to use the note summarizing prompt so that I can understand what happened in the six other meetings that I missed because I was off, you know, goofing off and sailing around on my yacht, <laughs> which I don't know. How come you never invite me on your yacht? <laughs> <laughs> it's not seaworthy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just use the user stories. Okay. So... Today, what we covered was essentially answering the question um, from us a more systematic perspective of how do you write better prompts. We talked about the guardrails using the different keywords to, to write guardrails. We talked about um, writing prompts in a templated format so that they can scale, so you can write with machines or with other employees and a system for managing them. If you've got some suggestions about how you're managing your software development, because that's what prompt engineering is, uh, and you want to share those stories, or maybe even your prompts, you can go to our free Slack group, go to trustinsights.ai, where uh, slash analytics for marketers, where you and over 3,000 other marketers are asking and answering each other's questions every single day. And wherever it is you watch or listen to the show, if there's a platform you'd rather have it on instead, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast. Uh, you can find the show on pretty much every place that's available within reason. Uh, and while you're there, Wherever it is you choose to consume the show, please leave us a rating and a review. It does help to share the show. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.